Good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And today we have our good friend, Ann Perry. Uh, here's the brand new book, Death with a Double Edge, the new Daniel Pitt novel. And we have, uh, we still have some copies that have this nice letter signed by Ann tucked in. And I'll put a, uh, I'll put a link in the comments field uh, so you can order a copy if you'd like. And for those of you watching on Facebook, which will be everybody, um, I will be monitoring the comments field. So if you have questions for Anne, go ahead and type them in, and then I will reappear on the screen towards the end of the program and ask some of your questions. And I just may have a few questions of my own for Anne too. Um, we always have great, com deep philosophical conversations when you're here. I always look forward to that. Um, yeah. But Barbara is uh, going to be hosting the show from her office, home office, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, Barbara. Thank you, Patrick. Welcome, Anne. It's lovely to see you. Thank I you. like your background there. There's a particularly nice painting kind of over your, over your ear. <laughs> it's a dear friend of mine painted What's lots it? of pictures, and when she was hard up and couldn't find anybody else with good taste as well, I bought a lot of them, and I've never regretted it. Mostly trees. Yeah, that's a really nice thing to do, but also pleasant for you to have them. Yes. And I guess you like books, right? Mm. Indeed. Well, in introducing Anne, there's absolutely no way that I can go through the entire enormous oeuvre that she's got. So I will mention that she has written one series with Charlotte and Thomas Pitt, of which this Daniel Pitt book is an outgrowth. And this is book four, following 21 Days, Triple Jeopardy, and one fatal flaw. Uh, she's also written books featuring William Monk, another Victorian series, um, stray standalone books, and two books so far in the 1930s with Elena Standish. The Death third and Focus one comes out this fall. The ah, third so one one and I put books. down the pen from the fourth one. You did? Put down the pen oh. to come and visit with you. Oh, good. Well, I certainly hope so. I mean, surely by now we can start traveling again. And there's a World War I quintet. So, you know, I, I just figure if you're watching this, you've obviously read some of the various books. And we'll just focus on Daniel Pitt today. So good. Daniel, Daniel is the junior barrister. He did not follow his father, Thomas, into the police force. And no. if you recall, Thomas and Charlotte's marriage is really a class bridging marriage. Charlotte came from a uh, a higher social ranking than Thomas did. And so she's been helpful in his, in his investigations, but she's also kind of upped his game. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Victorian phrase. She had access to places that he wouldn't have. And she understood a class of person that he couldn't because that was not how he was born. But he's climbed rather successfully. He has and indeed. And now he's- At the very you know, end of the last pit, he was knighted. And he became Sir Thomas Pitt. And Lady Charlotte. Yes. That's very nice. And you, you moved him um, up through Scotland Yard, and then you moved him into Special Branch, which um, at the end of the, of the 19th, early 20th century was a really pivotal job because there was the anarchists were on the loose. There was a lot going on. and much a, of lot of, a lot of civilian bombings and really dangerous things. I did really, it was formed to fight against the Irish uh, bomb, bombing in England, but it went on to be any sort of anti-terrorist uh, home-based thing, as opposed to uh, doing stuff ab abroad, which would be MI6. Right, well, we have anarchists, we have communists, we have, you know, lots of things bubbling along, which so what else up in the war and afterward. Yes. So anyway, Daniel, Daniel has elected to go into the law, not in law enforcement, but rather the legal part of it. So he's a junior barrister. Well, he had an opportunity for an education, which Thomas never had. But do you think Thomas would have chosen to be a Probably to practice not. law? No. It was a matter of his time and place. Yeah. But also his personality. I mean, he's he's um He's more of a questing beast than he is, yes, um, yes. you know, and I don't think that the being a barrister in particular, maybe. I don't know. think it would have suited him at all, no. but I had to make Daniel something different. And that seemed like a, a nice thing to be battling either 
for the truth or for the defense of what was not so pleasant, but having defined the truth still. Well, I'll, you know, your books generally have trials in them. And, um, you know, you've, you've taken us into a lot of courtrooms you know, over the course of all these books. So it's not surprising that Daniel, I mean, one day you'll probably have him take silk and he can be like a queen's counsel, but well, right now, now if, he's if not I there. Not long, yes. <laughs> because it's, it's the ultimate drama, isn't it? Like the Egyptian balancing the soul of the dead. It's the final dramatic, ultimate dramatic thing. Does this person go up or down the final judgment? Well, that's I don't think it's as simple as that, but yeah. Well, and symbolically, um, you know, the, the judges who presided over the criminal courts when they came to capital cases actually put on a black cap to, oh, yes. um, to come out and pronounce. The death penalty in England was not abolished. I'm trying to remember. Was it after the war? It's after 50s. World War II? Yes. I think it was the 50s. I think so too. That sort of sticks in my mind. So yeah. the stakes, the stakes in a trial at the time that Anne is writing about with, with Charlotte and Thomas and Anne Daniel, the stakes were high because you know, if you were convicted, you That's and they didn't mess around with appeals either. I mean, when they put on the black cap and sentenced you, it was it was like what two weeks? Three, 21 days, which is why the first one is titled 21 right. days. Yes. Exactly. Yep, off to the hangman, and and that was it. So anyway. Um, I really like, this book begins with a, a just a position of a respectable barrister murdered in a deeply unrespectable part of London, and that yeah. he's dead. And so the question is, why was he there? And, and it doesn't feel as though it would have been a natural death because there was no reason for him to be there. So I thought yeah. that was an interesting premise. Mile End, tell us about Mile End because it, it's a really shady part of the city. Well, it's East End and it's, generally, it's roughly the, the area of Jack the Ripper. All those streets that we've come to know, such as Mitre Square and I forget, forgetting street names all over the place, um, but that, that whole Whitechapel Mile End area, one runs into the other, was a slum and it, it, it was, where you would find opium dens and brothels and more or less almost anything you wanted that was the other side of the law. So when this unfortunate man is found dead there, there's a suspicion that perhaps he was looking for prostitutes or he was up to- Not up to any know. good anyway. It's no. possible where he went there to deal with some client, but it doesn't seem likely. And why was he chasing clients of that quality? because he was one of the senior lawyers and a bit of a difficult man to know, but very clever. And in fact, very successful and brought lots of money into yes. Daniel's firm. And Daniel's really concerned um, about the welfare. Not only is he a pappy, that the man's name is Marcus Ford Croft, for yes. two small Fs. I just love that British spelling. <laughs> I know. Um, is, is it pronounced any, any differently, Anne, even if you have no, a couple Fs? Um, the one that you'll probably see most often is Fitch with two small Fs. There are quite a lot of Fitches around. Okay. So well, around this that. is Marcus Fordcroft. So, yes. so Daniel not only um, admired Marcus, and I'm just going to call him Marcus because Fordcroft yes. goes out forever, um, not only admired Marcus and um, was puzzled as to why he was there, but he's also worried about the firm, whether their reputation will take a big hit if yes. Marcus was down there and up to no good, and whether the finances of the firm are going to be imperiled because Marcus was like, you know, the big money guy. So well, there's the, a lot the, going the victim was name was Drake. He was the big earner. Drake was the actual victim. Oh, do I have them mixed yes. up? I thought it was Marcus that died. No, Marcus is head of the firm and he's Sir Miriam's father. Ah, okay, I'm sorry. So it was a guy named Drake that died. So the question is, why was Marcus, what? Why well, was Drake down there? He was a, one of the cleverest lawyers in the firm, but a difficult man to get to know or like. And what was he doing down there? Oh, all right. Marcus is the head of the firm, the one yep. that Daniel's concerned about. And the, the man who's dead, Drake, is the, is the lawyer. I'm sorry. I yes. Their names. 
happens to me a lot. Too many, well, too many characters, one way or another. <laughs> no, um, it's just that I read the book so far in advance of actually talking to you. That yes. And my memory can fail me when it comes to... I understand perfectly. Things. I write them in advance too. <laughs> yes, you do. All right. So, so Daniel doesn't really have any authority to go investigating. And in fact, he's probably probably going to be discouraged because, um, you know, it's a dangerous place to go. He's but... always afraid of what he will find. And yet, if you don't know, you can't guard against it. So he's sort of between a rock and a hard place. He really is. Um, and, and he's on his own. But he does go. He does have a chance to spend time with his parents. And he does go and consult them. Yes. So that's really nice. We get to have some scenes where Daniel and Thomas are, you know, are talking about this. And I really, well, I really, really like out, it. He's really out of his depth, uh, Daniel. He needs good counsel. But uh, between a rock and a hard place is a good good situation to have your hero in. Well, you have Daniel essentially in his father's role, which is investigating your crime in, yes. this, in this book. And so I think, you know, it's an interesting thing because, I mean, ideally at the end of it, he would have had, he will have uh, more understanding, perhaps more empathy for Thomas's career and actions than he might have had before. That's a good point. Yes. I must, yeah. I must be sure to follow that up. <laughs> I'm sure you will. All right. So anyway, here's Danielle. Now, Miriam, who is the daughter of Marcus. Yes. Um, now that I got Marcus in the right place. Miriam, whom Daniel has a friendship with, but we're not quite clear what kind of relationship. She is away. So normally, normally he would be consulting her. But in this book, he's not able to do that. Yes, that's right. But she's back again in... In the next one, oh, good. I think I've written the next one, and she's back. Five, yes. Okay. I have to be considerably ahead of uh, give my publisher time to make an excellent job, and and they do. Um, yeah, I'll but be... she's qualified by then because women couldn't; they could study, but they couldn't be qualified in Britain to be a pathologist. And she wants to be taken seriously so she can give evidence in court. So she's gone to Holland which is the one place reachable from Britain where they will teach a woman and give her passing grades if she's earned them, qualify her. Yeah, With the help um, of I'm trying to remember the name. Here I go again, trying to remember things. But anyway, there's a, there's a wonderful book set in the reign of Henry II um, in which a woman who's, I think, been trained in maybe Naples or anywhere, somewhere in mm -hmm. Southern Europe, um, comes to England and she is, for her day, she is a pathologist. And uh, I'll, I'll, Patrick, you can you can try to look this up for me because I'm floundering here. But anyway, it was the same problem that there were no women, in fact, actually no men yeah. who were qualified pathologists back in the um, 12th century. So um, there she was. Yeah. There's something men around. would do it, of course, in, in uh... Daniel's time, but women were still well difficult enough to be recognized as a doctor, never mind as a pathologist. But you'd think, considering that we deal with birth and death, that men would have recognized that we're not as squeamish as you think. But, you know. Right. So Patrick has, as he always does, saved me by locating the name of the author of the medieval book, which is Ariana Franklin, who was a, it's actually a pen name for. Um, for an author of, of different things, but I love the Ariana Franklin series, and you know it's it's way back in time compared to this, but it's still about the struggle of a woman to pursue oh, yeah. an unorthodox career. And part of it was that that it, there was a you know that ladies should not be dabbling in blood in guts and cadavers and you know the scene exactly. of life but it's the mistress of the art of death that's it thank you patrick oh, that is the title very interesting i very recommend interesting. it it's a it's a terrific book um and you know since you're you find that um do you know any good bookshops <laughs> we do actually well but i mean it's it's a it's an interesting thing because miriam what you're writing about miriam and her struggles you know to um become accredited 
in by going to Holland um, are very similar to the mistress of the art of death, um, despite the okay. centuries that lie between them. So you might want to look one, it up. One of the most interesting people of that time was Eleanor of Aquitaine, the only person I know of who was married to three kings in a row. Um, she was really something. And she also lived to be into her 80s, despite having some um, interesting childbirth I mean, you know, she had a child in her 40s, which was practically unheard of. She traveled. I mean, she went She went on crusade. She traveled. She, went the wrong woman. Channel. Yeah. she was a remarkable woman. I've always been sorry that, you know, we didn't have a chance to know her because she must just must have been amazing. Yes, perhaps she didn't write. And didn't, didn't keep a diary, but that would have been very interesting. Um, I've often thought that one of the most interesting long drawn out games would be to ask several people who's which real life character would you write a, a first person diary for if you could do so and she would be a jolly interesting one wouldn't she absolutely and you know at that time since britain um i mean she she was the Duchess of Aquitaine. So England had claim to considerable swath of France, thanks to Eleanor. Well, gradually, yeah. gradually lost it over the course Most of the century. The big losses were under John. But yes, we, of course, William of Normandy conquered us, and then we went and had so much of France because his heirs were heirs to his bits of France. Right. All very complicated. Went back and forth, right. I'm yes. sure that Eleanor in later life wished that John had never been born. He was the child of her 40s, but, you yeah. know, um, he, it's interesting how, you know, some people can inherit all their parents' good qualities, and some of them seem to, like, drink the poison. And John, John got his parents' bad qualities on both sides, I might add. Yes, and yet he was excessively clean. He bathed at least once a month. <laughs> <laughs> That was unheard of. You must be mad. All right. Well, let's go back. Let's go back to Daniel Pitt because mm -hmm. um, we are. Are we now in Edwardian England? What year are we in? Yes, we are. Well, so Victoria died in 1912, I think. I are think. We, are we? Well, really I'm in 12 because I've written the one after that. Oh, okay. Maybe, well, maybe, anyway, Edwardian maybe right. England is different than Victorian England. So um, yeah. Um, that so king how, didn't go that long. How does Daniel proceed? I mean, here he has this conundrum, and we can't we can't say what he finds out. But how does he proceed when he realizes that it's going to be up to him to look into the death of this man and try to figure out um, the fate of his law firm? Very, very carefully and with some trepidation. Now, I've written one since then, and disentangling in my brain how that one finished. I can remember how the one after that finished, but. Well, I'll give you a clue. Um, and I will say that in case you think that political cronyism is a modern phenomenon, there is political cronyism to spare in death with a double edge. And you realize that pursuing true justice can really stumble um, over the kinds of barriers that are erected when rich people and politicians and so forth are, are involved. That's probably all we should say. But I did think the coronism aspect of this book was really interesting. Thank you. You put it better than I can because I'm my most of my mind is on the one I'm constructing now, which is an Elena. Oh, wonderful. Well, we can talk about that in a minute. Elena number four, but you've got number three to come yet. So you're you're happy with Daniel. I mean, Daniel was in a way kind of an experiment when you started, but I think you've given him some really interesting problems to solve. And are you enjoying his company? Yes, yes, I am. I sort of need to work to get into it a bit with change of you know, grinding change of gears, but yes. And he's a different, different from his father, different from his mother, and it's a very different time period. And I'm trying to make the differences apparent in the story, not just the scientific differences, but the big cultural differences too. And, you know, the Industrial Revolution has accelerated. Um, there's strains in the empire. I mean, we're beginning to approach the peak yes. at the, the end. 
of the British Empire, which is basically destroyed by the two world wars. But I'm not sure that it wasn't going to begin to sunder even without the wars, the things that put well, it- Well, time together. and progress has to happen. And if you try to stand in its way, it's just silly. Well, a lot of it, I mean, if you really look at a map of the British Empire at, let's say, the height of Victorianism, or let's say the end of the 19th century, so many of the, um, the territories that Britain had abroad were all connected with the Navy and with shipping. Yes. You know, well, you, had Malta, you had Suez, you had um, the shakedoms in the Gulf, you had you know, India, and then, you know, going around, you had um, mm. Singapore and Malaysia and Hong Kong. Can um, I just answer this telephone and tell them I'll call sure. them back? It's going on ringing. I'm sorry okay. about that. I'll talk to myself. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Give up. That's right. So, I mean, you know, it, it depends. I mean, if while naval power and while transportation of goods um, was so critical in the 19th century, um, when airplanes came in and other, other stuff happened, I'm not sure that the, you know, the strain of all that wouldn't have sort of broken up a lot of the... Um, Yet I think when this ship got stuck sideways in the Suez Canal just a little while ago, it was going to affect the whole world, one ship blocking the canal. Yeah, but times change. Every empire has its, its, its beginnings, its expansion a little while, at the height of its power, and then it disintegrates and changes into something else. It's now the British Commonwealth, which is still, oh, it's a loose sort of connection, but it is a connection. And uh, most of us speak English for a reason. Well, yeah, English became the lingua franca, so to speak, um, yes. of the world. Um, but, you know, now, now the American century was basically the 20th century, and now China's really pushing at the door asking to be an equal and, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to know. The, the first couple of decades of every century are really riven um, by, by change. After the French Revolution and the turn of the 1700s into the 1800s. And then we had the Napoleonic Wars and then we had, you know, World War I and before that we had the South Sea bubble. And before that we had, you know, Louis the 14th and all the, you know, the Duke of Marlborough and all that. If you keep going yes. back, you can see that for some reason, whatever comes together over the course of a century always seems to sort it of does. peak and then, and then bang, you know, things it's change. The history two hmm? It's almost as if history could count. Yeah, it is. It, 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 it was the last decade of the century. Better do something wild. <laughs> well, I hope heading into the 20s, we're going to achieve, a, you know, but look back at the 20th century, you know, after the, the war and after the, the flu and the whole bit, the 20s yes. were kind of a, and then it all began to disintegrate again because of various inequities and so forth that that had and that you said various inequities that's what it is it builds up a pressure point and something is going to like the earth if it builds up a pressure point there's going to be a quake right so when i read books that are set in the edwardian era i'm always conscious of the fact that you know um the certainties of that time based upon the 19th century and victoria are are headed to do to break up um and yes. you, you almost hear a clock ticking when you're reading anything that is set after victoria dies up to 1914 when the clock really well, ticks. people sometimes ask me why i wanted to write stories about world war one because it was the end of history and the beginning of the modern world everything was different after 1918 particularly for women well, and that that's a game, you know, if you think about it, women's suffrage, uh, all kinds of um, all kinds of rights developed um, and, and women had to take jobs that previously they had been denied. And, um, you know, World War Two accelerated that. And from our standpoint today, there are as many women or even more running corporations and, you know, practicing as doctors and lawyers. I think there are more women lawyers than there are men at the moment. I might have that wrong, but at least it's close. I believe that. And there are far more women uh, respected as, as the head or the best brain in a certain area 
than what could have been imagined before 1920. It's a really fascinating book um, uh, by Jillian Cantor that just came out called Half-Life. Patrick actually did a Zoom with her. And she wrote about Marie Curie. And what she did, Anne, that's really interesting, is, is what they now call a sliding door structure. But basically, mm -hmm. It's it's half a biography and you know a fictionalized mm -hmm. biography of Marie Curie, her real life and what she did. She left Poland, she came to Paris, she studied, she married Pierre, whatever. But the other half of the book and the part that slides back and forth is that what if she stayed in Poland? What if she married her childhood sweetheart? What if mm -hmm. and what would her life have been like had she not? made that pivotal decision to go to Paris to study. And, you know, um, her opportunities had she stayed behind were going to be less, obviously, than by going to Paris. But she was um, very much, you know, in action as a scientist and as a, um, it's interesting. You know, a woman breaking barriers. Is if she had not done that, somebody would have sometime, but how long would it have been? And how different would the world have been at that time? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, people like her who make significant, who have significant achievements, make significant discoveries that really alters um, in her, you know, medicine, way, all kinds of stuff. And of course, eventually it killed her because nobody really yeah. understood radiation and shielding from radiation. But I think she lived into her 60s. I was surprised. I thought for some reason she had died at a younger age. But uh, so did I. Yeah, no, apparently, I, th I think I'm remembering it right. I'd have to double check there with Half-Life, but I think she actually lived into her 60s. Pierre died young. Pierre, uh, they were not married a super long time. And then her children, uh, at least her daughter, has, you know, worked on in this yes. in this area. But um, it's a life that, that moved across the time period we're talking about, you know, the yes. early... Was 60. I used to think my grandmother was an old lady at 60 something. And here but we both know. are. Here we both are in our 80s talking to each other. Yes. 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 I know. Um, I thought I thought my grandmother was an absolute antique when she was <laughs> she was 60. So you know, even now our perception of of um, how we lead our lives and how long we can lead our lives and better health care and all of yes, that. Yes, but um, you and I are pushing the front boundaries, but maybe by the time we get to 90, that won't be so old. Well, we'll see. Push it ahead. 80 is the new 60 is my general motto, but we'll see whether yeah. I think 90 is the new 70. I remember Mary Higgins Clark was quoted when she um, she had written a book every year during her 80s. And after her 89th birthday, when she had turned in a book, her publisher asked her if she were working on a new book. And she said the difference between 89 and 90 was much bigger than she had expected. I'm not ready for that yet. No, I know. I've kept that in mind, but I'm hoping to push past it. In any case. Um, at that point, and I think I reach it just before you do, uh, it'll, be, it'll be the new 70 or something. That's my plan. So tell us a little bit before we quit. Tell us a little bit about Elena Standish, because I know that that's a series that's really exciting you moving into the 1930s. Yes. What's going on there after two books? Uh, well, the next book, she has American grandparents on her mother's side, as you might remember. She goes to visit them with her mother and father for their 60th wedding anniversary. And there is a big party. She meets them for the first, we meet them for the first time, and she doesn't really know them very well. Uh, it's a very big party, and there she meets a woman she finds extremely attractive, um, an intelligent, interesting woman, and she likes her. But by the end of that party, that woman's body is found in the car park. Somebody's run over her and killed her. It, it cannot be an accident because of various things. I mean, they backed over her as well. Um, somebody is arrested that night and Elena spends the rest of, most of the rest of the story trying to unravel who was this woman, was she a spy, but for whom, and who is guilty. Uh, she, it's, it's a member of her family and she spends the time trying to prove his innocence. Sounds wonderful. They've really been interesting. And you've gone to some cool places. I mean, Trieste, for example, which I have only been to once. Um, but, 
Well, but it's a city that, you know, has a pretty checkered history politically because of its oh, location. Yeah. It's belonged to a number of countries in... Um, and the uh, poor old um, uh, Engelbert Dolphus does get killed shortly after that story. He really was assassinated. Was he? Oh, yes. Sandy heard that. I have a note from Patrick that Marie Curie was born in 1867 and lived to be 67, which is oh. older, as I said, than I thought. But so she lived during, you know, call it 1870 to round it up. She lived through this really pivotal age from solid Victoria. Yes, in from history into the present day, so to speak. Yep, um, into, yeah. So, I mean, that-, that Well, was, into my lifetime anyway. A life of significant change. You know, I find myself looking at what's going around in the world at the moment and thinking, I hope, I would, I would just as soon not have hugely significant change going on all around me, but, um, um, you know. Well, it's a sense, in a way, I feel very much, here we go again. Yes. We don't learn. But maybe it's just, you know, um, a sort of comfort and possibly a myth to think that things stay stable for very long. Maybe very long is like 10 years and, you know, yes. it's just I, I foolish right. to expect it to be, to be more. So we have King Edward comes to the throne in 1901. I think Victoria dies in January. And um, and he dies in, is it 1911? Yes, I'm, I'm on to the next king now. Ah, George Jeff. V. Yes. Right. And he goes quite a while. He takes me up into Elena's territory. He does, because he died in 1935, so. Yes, and then, then we get the abdication and so forth. And that's going to be a wonderful testing period to write about. The, the, the 1930s are absolutely amazing. I'm so glad I didn't look through them, but nonetheless, you know, looking back. Hang yeah. on, love, you're about to live through them again, I think. Well, we may. Um, it's, I'm hoping not, but yes, I, I mean, England uh, for almost an entire year, we had the whole drama uh, with Edward and Mrs. Simpson. I mean, George died again early in the year and, and you, you know, know it, we, went, it went all the way through until he made if, it. Uh, if America hadn't given us Mrs. Simpson, we'd have had to invent her. Um, as it turned out, it was probably a good thing. And now history oh, yes. is repeating itself, you know, with another American wife creating havoc. So um, um, quite the way, uh, because Harry is royal, but he's, he's nowhere near the throne. Right. Uh, Edward was the king, and I'm afraid he did some very bad things. Well, I think it was fortunate. I, I agree with Winston Churchill, who was an enormous supporter of his actually marrying Mrs. Simpson way back at the beginning. But after the war, I think he was, I think he has been quoted as saying that Britain should erect a cross in every marketplace for Mrs. Simpson because yeah. he kept Edward off the throne during the war, which would have been dreadful. Oh. And Edward's younger That's brother, been, George VI, was the right problem for Elena to deal with in the future when she's given the job of uh, Knowing that there is a plot against Edward's life and having to deal with it. I'm so looking forward to that, but I've got several years to go. I just need to live long enough to get that far. To write them all. Do you remember the Brother Catfield mysteries written by the wonderful Ellis Peters? Did you ever read Brother them? Catfield? Oh, yes. Right. So, I mean, she was a dear friend and, and we had many conversations. I went to visit her in Shrewsbury after she had her leg amputated, mm. which was the last time I saw her because sadly she didn't survive yeah. long thereafter. But her goal had been to write her way all the way up through the war between Stephen and Matilda that finally uh -huh. got Henry on the throne. And she didn't quite make it. Um, her life was cut short before she got to her, her end goal. She wasn't that old either, was she? Sorry? She wasn't all that old either, was she? I think Edith was, she might have been nearly 80. I'd have to look it up, but I mean, she looked- Not old. old. Wash your mouth out. Sorry. Um, but in any case, by, by absolute chance, the last book she wrote, the 20th one, which is a nice figure, um, mm -hmm. it, it was, a, was a lovely place to leave Brother Cadville. It didn't get to the end of the political conflict, but it, it's just as a book that turned out to be the capstone um of of these marvelous books and you know i was so grateful 
that that happened, that she had that, you know, opportunity to write that final book. You know, it's tragic. I mean, it's tragic for you. Um, and it's tragic for any author to, to leave us. But it's tragic for readers that the characters go with the author. Yes. Yes. Although actually for enjoying reading, I liked her present day, well, present day at the time she wrote them, because her descriptions were so beautiful. I went back and read several of them over and over. Me too. And I, I, I thought her most interesting book, and I absolutely love this dilemma, and there was no real solution to it, was the wife. There was a couple, and the man decided that um, he was going to take vows and enter a life of celibacy in the in the monastery and that left her nowhere she couldn't yeah. get a divorce her husband was gone um and what what was to become of her and um i i thought edith wrote that book with with real sympathy and and that was one in which you actually sympathized more with the killer than you did anybody else in the book that was one of her gifts, though, wasn't it? To make people understandable and empathetic and still capable of doing something yeah. that society abhors. But, you know, I mean, she was she was not a sentimentalist and she she put that woman in that vice, you know, and it really right. was one. Um, I, yeah, she was quite tough minded. I mean, you know, there, there, as you say, there's some romance in there. Her descriptions are gorgeous. I've been to Shrewsbury, unfortunately, almost none of it's recognizable from what, I mean, there's still the, yes, my gate and the Welsh gate and all the bridge and the Welsh and all the rest of it. But, but you know, where the monastery would have been is just, there's a little fragment of a church left mm -hmm. and there's a railroad yard that it's not very pretty that goes across it. But anyway. It's countryside though. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a beautiful part. Yeah, it is a, a border you city. But read the poetry of Harrisman at all. But I, I guess my point was, rambling around here, um, is that, the, that even though that situation would be different today, the kinds of problems that people faced centuries and centuries ago are still, in essence, the same problems that we are That's facing. That's why it's good to write about them. We can identify with it. That could be me. Yeah. And one wishes we could learn from history, but it seems, you know, it's always said, and it's true, that oh, we are doomed that. to repeat it. That's, that's why it's valuable to write a historical story and get all the, the feelings and the social stuff and set right. But the emotions are basically the same because we don't yeah. change. And what's it's sad, we don't learn. And, and people are still, um, they still have the same bad impulses and good impulses, but not really, <laughs> psychology is not really all that different. So let's call Patrick up from his black box and see if he has questions of his own or questions from the audience. Yes. I love the way he does this. I think Zoom is fabulous. Hello, Patrick, you're back. Thanks Hi. for feeding me that bit of information. It's nice that you always save me when my memory <laughs> fails like that. Brr. I've been trying to multitask, not very successfully uh, listening to this program. It's been really fascinating. Um, let's see, we have a lot of people tuning in, and most of the comments are just how much they love your work, Anne, and things like that. Oh, well, but, I never grow tired of hearing that, because uh, yes. like um, any other writer, I remember the one one that, that says criticism, not good, and you forget all the nice things that people say. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, there's, there are a few questions about the new, will there be a new Monk book eventually? I, well, eventually, I don't know, but I have no plans. I'm doing one, um, one Daniel and one Elena and one Christmas novella a year, and that keeps me busy six days to seven days a week. So nothing on the immediate horizon, but you don't no. rule it out. Well, I, I never rule things out because I just don't know. There is a Christmas novella, but Monk doesn't feature in it so much as uh, Celia and Hooper. Mm. I think that was last Christmas. But that part of your Christmas novella is part of the point is to bring up um, these yes. secondary characters and give them stories of their own that you don't have it room is. to explore or don't fit in a regular novel. Well, ones I feel I like and I want to know what happened to them and hope other people want to know as well. Yeah. Right. Um, let's see. Our friend L.J. Roberts uh, 
She says, I had the pleasure of introducing Anne at an author event years ago in Alameda, California, while she was still living in Scotland. And her questions, um, let's see, how do you keep your series straight? In other words, how do you juggle going back and forth from each project? Uh, and do you, do you outline and do you still write in paper and pen? Uh, to take the answers backwards, yes, I still write with paper and pen. Um, I don't know that I do keep them straight. I think it's just the luck of the, the drunk and the whatever it was else that lo looks after. Um, and I, yes, I do outline. I've always outlined after the first two or three, you know, going back years and decades. But now this new contract I've got, which is a two year one, it requires that the first thing I do is write a detailed outline, like about 20 pages or so, single spaced outline and submit it to my editors before I begin to write. And that's when the, the most of the down payment of the contract comes, not on signature. And it, I'm actually finding it very helpful that I don't have to wait for them to read it and say it's okay, or I would ne never get started. I don't have time to take weeks off. But I do find it very, very helpful to have to do it. And then more or less, to have, not to say, well, I'm not sure about that, I'll come back to it. You have to have it to give it to the editor. And I am actually grateful that I, that, that I have no choice in the matter. Hmm. It imposes discipline on you, doesn't it? Yes, they don't pay me until I do it. So, you know, that's, <laughs> that's a very good piece of gentle force. <laughs> Nobody's asked this question yet, but it usually comes up. And I know you're living, you're living in Los Angeles. Uh, can you give us an update on the, the various uh, TV and film projects that might be in the works right now? The answer to that is simple, no. Uh, lots of things look good, but I, I can't give you an announcement until there is one. But uh, everybody keep hoping because it takes a long while and COVID hasn't helped anything, right. except maybe pharmaceutical companies. Right. Um, I don't, I don't it's believe... nice to be asked. Yeah, yeah. Let's see here. Um, blah, blah, blah. What do we have? Well, I was going to ask you a little bit about um, your World War I novels. Um, how many of those did you write? Five. One for each one year. For, of the... for each year, right. I it was only only, only um, four years, but it, it covered, covered bits of four or five. 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Did that take, was that, was that a completely different approach for you? Um, yes, because you know, it was finite. The, the yeah. end of the war, that was the end of the story. Right. Was that, what was it like to, to research and write those particular books? Very, very emotional, very harrowing. I sat in tears, I remember one day, and I thought, you silly woman, this is a fictional character you've written. He doesn't exist. And you know that he's not dead. And then I realized I'm actually weeping for all those real ones who were dead because the feeling is the same. And yes, it's, it's, it's very harrowing. Because Would that have been your grandfather's generation? Yes. And my grandfather was a chaplain in the war and his name was Joseph Reedley. Wow. He was a chaplain in the trenches in the war. Yeah. He died before I was born. Did you happen to see, and I know this is a little bit of a digression, but did you happen to see that film that came out, oh, two or three years ago, a uh, documentary by Peter Jackson called They Would, I think it's called They Would Never Grow Old. And- um, I didn't actually, no. Barbara, did you see that? Yep. And it was- it's They will never difficult. grow old. It's yes, really difficult I believe so. to watch. You know, the, the sheer waste of lives in World War One yeah. is, is um, I mean, you know, the charge of the light brigade was similarly just nuts, you know, but it was a relatively small yeah. number of people, but. That's, that's quite a famous quotation. They will not grow old as we, the left grow old. Age shall not wear them, nor the years condemn. But they're going down at the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Which World War One poet was that? Oh, that's ridiculous. But there were quite a few. It, I don't it, know. Wilfred Owen, maybe? I don't think anybody as famous as that. Sassoon? Oh, Sassoon was as famous as Owen. Yeah, and so was Robert Graves. 
But uh, well, so with Rupert Brooke. I mean, lots of them. It's called <laughs> the Poets War by some because we lost so many. Yeah, but that I mean that documentary was so remarkable because of you know the narration was strictly these recorded testimonies from yeah. World War One veterans. It was amazing. But it um, does bring you to the edge of tears every time. But that that one, I think it's known as no, it's not a recessional, but whatever that one that I just quoted a verse from. I had to recite that at my stepfather's funeral wow. and keep myself from dissolving completely. Now, you, and I just... discussed, you and I have discussed several times um, the Blitz period, you know, when yeah. in London and um, with, with your 1930s series, do you have any kind of plan to kind of connect that era to the start of World War II? Oh, yes. I shall probably stop. Well, it depends how much longer I live, doesn't it? Because there are so many things in the 30s that are amazing. And so far, I'm on the fourth one, and I'm still, I've discovered about a year and a quarter. So you've got a little ways to go. Well, the, the one I'm doing at the moment, I don't know what I'm going to call it. The next one is A Darker Reality. And that comes out, it's coming out in Britain about now, and here in the autumn. We keep getting in sync and out again. Um, but the one after that is the Night of the Long Knives. And that's um, June to, into July of 34. So the history of the 30s is absolutely, it's stunning. But the other thing that's exciting, the music was lovely. The popular music was so lovely and the clothes. It's got nothing to do with what happened, but it's a lovely background. Because right. I love getting beautiful clothes for my characters. Well, it's amazing to it's amazing to uh, to see to, you know the, the whole Weimar era in Germany and all that you know decadence yeah. and opulence and and then what oh, was, by the way, what was it's got coming. nothing to do with that, but a lot to do with echoes. Vera Lynn died just very recently. She was a hundred and something. Yeah, and wrote her bicycle we'll meet again. every day. I think it was remarkable. But yeah, she was really a voice at that time, wasn't she? Yes, yes. I think somebody, somebody just well, came on screen and saved us. Uh, they will not grow old. Is uh, from the Fallen by Lawrence Binion. That's right. Thank you. I couldn't right. remember. What it was I do have a couple I, of I questions. Would, I won't allow you to say I'm getting old, but I am losing my memory in bits and pieces. <laughs> I do have a few more questions that have just come in. Um, uh, Karen Oden, she says, first, I want to thank Anne for blurbing my second novel, which was very kind. And then she says, uh, by the way, she's going to be joining us very shortly. Um, I'm wondering, given that you've spent years immersed in Victorian and now Edwardian England, do you still discover new facts in your research for your new books, things that surprise you? Yes, occasionally, how much we repeat ourselves, how little we learn, and how much yesterday was like today in, in ways you wouldn't have thought of, and yet how it was completely different, particularly in regard to women. I mean, at the, after the end of World War I, uh, one, or probably just before the end, I mean, we, we cut off our hair and we shortened our skirts and we got to work and people were very glad of it. And the other big difference was Jack and his master bleed exactly the same way in the trenches. So it was never quite different. Like aristocrats don't bleed blue, they bleed scarlet like the rest of us. And that is a great leveler when you realize that Jack might have as much courage and as much brains as his master. And yet it's very surprising. Uh, I remember when Dennis Healy died and my mother said to me, he was a major political figure in Britain, and my mother said to me, that is the last one, who, a last politician who served in the war and got the, the spirit that the winning is the point, not you or me or this one or that one, but team. And by golly, she was right. There's an awful lot of every man for himself and to heck with the team around now. And I think people are different when they've had to make sacrifices and be part of a team and make the alterations to yourself that are necessary to do the job because it's survival. I mean, it really was survival for Britain, World War II. 
I could stand in my own back garden and look up and see the enemy fighter planes overhead. And our street was bombed. Makes you think. Yeah. You can um, always be grateful that Hitler, for some reason or other, decided, um, ignoring completely history and Napoleon, to turn towards Russia. Because if he hadn't, I think that Britain wouldn't have stood a chance. Very probably, and we did need America to come in too. We stood alone for a good while against their best efforts. But uh, I don't think we wouldn't have lasted indefinitely. But he didn't learn not to and try to invade England either, because Napoleon tried that too. Yeah. Well, you know, they say that those who don't learn history are condemned to repeat their mistakes. We've already said that, but you're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> that well, that one touches a painful spot for all of us, I think. But you should teach history in school, learn accurate history. Don't make your country the inventor and the winner of everything, because nobody is. But we 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 don't learn because we don't listen. We don't think. Andrew, anything else? Um, yeah, here's maybe a, a, a good final question. Uh, Wiley, he says, is there a period of history that you would like to write about that you haven't yet? Yes, there are two periods. I would love to. One is the French Revolution, particularly the, the High Terror, because I don't think there's been any, anything quite like that. And the people were so extraordinary. You couldn't invent somebody like Robespierre. You know, he, he never actually saw the guillotine until he was taken to it himself in a tumbrel. And he used to despise, you know, it was leader of, of rising against everybody. And yet he walked around in the Ancien Regime costume with high heeled Cuban heeled shoes and a white wig, sucking an orange because he had indigestion. That's about the worst thing you can do for indigestion. And uh, Marat, who was murdered in his bath by Charlotte Corday, bath was boot shaped. Um, you know, they're quite extraordinary. And if I could write one person's fictional diary, it would be Joseph Fouché. He was in the priesthood and left it, or trained for it and left it, married, had a little daughter who died as a baby. And he came out of hiding during the high terror and walked behind her coffin to the grave. I mean, it wasn't even a son, it was just a daughter. And yet he was the one who overthrew Robespierre so brilliantly cleverly. And he rose to power under the Republic and then under Napoleon and died in his bed of old age. But the things he saw and participated in, I think he's a bit of a monster, but what he saw and what he, well, anyway, the French Revolution, the high terror. And uh, the other one is the beginning of the really seriously um, dangerous Inquisition in Spain about 1485. That was when it came to Aragon, I think. And the character of Torquemada, who was the Inquisitor General. And I think the, we don't do that with religion now at least I said, fingers crossed, but we do it politically. I'm going to save your soul, whether you want me to or not. I'm going to make you adopt democracy because, you know, I'm going to bomb you to smithereens until you do. And it's the same thing, believing that my religion is right, I'm going to force you to adopt it, whether you believe it or not, and quite against everything it actually teaches. I'll burn you if you don't uh, adopt my God, my Christian God. And I, I, I heard a story about Torquemada writing late into the night, and he was writing by candlelight, of course, we're talking the 1480s, and uh, the hot wax fell from the candle onto his hand and he didn't feel it because he was so absorbed in what he was doing. That's terrifying. Mm. And it's so symbolic of his whole attitude about everything that I, I need to live another 80 years at least. Well, I'm hoping that you're going to go down pen in hand when the time comes. Well, yes, I can pick up. I leave a pen close to me, always. I can't help but think of Mel Brooks when you say Torquemada. <laughs> Did you ever see that History of the World uh, film? 
No, I didn't. Wow. Somebody watch people watching probably have. It's 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 pretty good. There's but, so many uh, people who have written the history of the world. It's uh, it's interesting that the things that different people find interesting, but Torquemada is terrifying as an example of religious fervor that can justify things that are appallingly against the religions you profess to believe. But we do this thinking that we know better than other people what we should do, what we should believe, what kind of government or, or religious we sh religion we should have, and we'll force it on people. And most of those governments or religions teach the absolute opposite. Tolerance is not is not a strong point, unfortunately. And Pardon? right at the moment, you know, we're going through this big upheaval here about and things have gotten politicized that shouldn't be, you know, health yeah. issues, you know, a vaccination is a political statement, a mask is a political statement and all. And, you know, yeah. it's it's absurd. And I, I don't even know how it happened, but it's really awful. No, I don't know either, kind of but I, I watch it. I mean, I, I think I shouldn't be watching this. It should be working and I'm still sitting glued to it because I suppose it's a study in human nature and that's got to be interesting to any writer. Hmm. Well, on that cheerful note, um, let me thank Anne. It's always a delight to see her. I'm going to be a lot happier when she can come back to Scottsdale because one of our treats is we go out to dinner before we do events. Oh, yes. Yes. I really miss that. Uh, we went to our restaurant, in fact, last night with some friends and, and I thought of you and they asked me how the authors were missing them because, you know, it was... Oh, um, yes. We yeah. were like live people. But, you know, this is a lot better than for many people whose jobs have ceased to exist. I'm working harder than ever. Yeah, well, we are too, which I mean, and there's a lot of interesting new things that we have learned to do that um, we, will, we will be carrying forward. So if those of you watching, if you're interested in Victorian mystery in about half an hour, Will Thomas and Karen Oden are going to be talking to us about his book, which is set back in I'm trying to think, 1890s. So we're still with Victoria and the Tsarevich of Russia, not yet uh, Nicholas II, has come to London for a royal wedding. Um, and so, I mean, I think it's a wonderful book. I really enjoyed it. So well, he, was, uh, he was Victoria's son-in-law, wasn't he? And well, he and Alex oh. were both, you know, both related to Victoria in the same way that Elizabeth and Philip turns out to be, you know, related to Victoria. Well, the pool other. is quite small. The yes. pool of people from whom you can happily choose is quite small. But talking about Philip, I'm, I mean, he had to go because he was a very old gentleman, but I'm, I'm still sort of, it's the passing of an age. You think what? It's the passing of an age. Oh, yeah, no, definitely so. I mean, you know, 99 is a... Um, Definitely the passing of an age um, and his funeral is tomorrow. So it's, um, I guess, an occasion for both mourning and for some people, um, I don't know. They're, they're, well, they're, it's a celebration of a life very well lived. Yes, indeed. I agree with you. So thank you all for watching it this afternoon and thank you for spending time with us. Um, and Bye. there will be a podcast available for our rambling discussion tomorrow and the video will yeah. live on forever. And I will remind you that this wonderful book, Death with the Double Edge, which comes with a letter that Anna's autographed. Um, it's difficult for her to manage signed books at home. So the letter is a, yes. is a very nice May way. May I to say goodbye to Patrick as well? You Great Anne. to see you, Anne, as always. Give me a telephone call sometime and I'll catch you up on what's happening. Okay. We'll do it. All I right. would be ill-advised if I were to say it for broadcast. By the way, before, before we stop, when I was at, the, I'll send you a photo of this. When I was in Paris, uh, right before the, the pandemic started, my wife and I went to uh, Shakespeare and Company and in the book stall outside, prominently placed was an Anne Perry novel. I took oh. a picture of it and I was going to send it to you and I just, I forgot, but I will. Oh, that would be very nice. Yeah. And if you could send it, you, were you going to send it via email or uh, in, on paper? Uh, I'll send it to you uh, with, over email. Oh, because I, I can't print off. I, I, this is an iPad. I can't print it off. Do you want me to print one out and send it to you? Okay. okay.
<laughs> okay. We could do that. We should send her the Ariana Frank. We should send her the Ariana Franklin book too. Now that I've remembered, thanks to yeah. you, it actually was the Mistress of the Art of Death. In any case, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day and and your weekend. Goodbye. Very Bye. much indeed. Bye bye.